Welcome back to my deep dive into the technical aspects of digital imagery as it applies to photography and videography. Now, before I get into the juicy stuff like color spaces and log formats and image quality and all of that kind of stuff that I know we all want to talk about, I want to actually start with the basics. Now, for some of you, this is going to be all old hat. And hopefully, if you already know all this stuff, maybe you'll get something out of this from the pers a different perspective or different point of view. But, of course, not everybody starts knowing everything, and so that this video is kind of for you. So if you're new to all of the stuff, like color and how it gets stored and how it gets processed in video, well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We are going to start with the basics in this video, and then we are going to build out from there. So in this video, I am going to introduce the two most common color models that are used in photography and video. That is the RGB model and the Luma Chroma color model. But before I get into actually talking about those, of course, I've just introduced a new word, color model or term. And if you're not familiar with that term, you might be wondering what exactly is a color model? Well, put simply, a color model is an abstract mathematical model that describes a way to store, process, manipulate, or just describe a color. It's one thing to say that my shirt is red. It's a much more complex thing to be able to store and share that precise color in a way that is reproducible for somebody on a different monitor elsewhere. Now, if you have been around this stuff long enough, you've probably already heard the term color space. And you might be wondering if it's related to what I'm talking about with color models. And in fact, it is. A color space is a concrete implementation of a color model. A color space takes that abstract idea that's codified or idealized in the model and the math that goes with it and applies all of the necessary details so that you can actually use it to describe a specific color. As I said, we're not talking about color spaces in this video. We will be talking about them in a lot more detail in future videos focusing on specific color spaces and what's going on. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's get to the first of our two color models, RGB color. So what is the RGB color model? And quite honestly, without trying to make an overly complicated answer out of it, the RGB color model is a way to describe color as a combination of different intensities of red, green, and blue light beams that are all combined together. Now, of course, that raises yet another question. Why red, green, and blue? Why not some other colors? Now, the simple answer to that is that those colors mirror how our eyes work. As a result, using those three colors is an efficient way to store and model the way our eyes work and therefore color in instances where the intended end product is for our consumption. To put a little more detail on that, our eyes have three types of cells that are responsible for color vision. These are designated as the L, M, and S cone cells, L, M, and S for long, medium, and short. And they describe the wavelength that those cells are sensitive to. So basically, those are sense cells are sensitive to red, green, and blue light, respectively. In many respects, our eyes work a lot like our cameras do. Or actually, the better way to say that is our cameras work an awful lot like our eyes. The reality is we don't see color. Well, not at least a way a spectrometer or a scientist would actually measure it. That is to say, we don't see a power spectrum where each wavelength is broken down or the power of each light is broken down at each wavelength and measured individually. I prefer to say that we perceive color. So each of those three cells in our eyes are sensitive to a wide range of wavelengths centered basically around the colors that I already mentioned. However, 
all of the wavelengths that those specific cone cells are sensitive to only become one stimulus that goes to our brain. So it doesn't differentiate between different shades of red. It just says there's some red. Then our brain basically, for lack of a better way to put it, makes up the color we see from how those three cone cells are stimulated and the various or the relative intensities. Now, a big consequence of this is that we don't need, therefore, to measure and reproduce every single wavelength of light to capture and reproduce color the way we see it. In fact, even though my camera is really only sensitive to three colors, red, green, and blue, like all cameras, and your monitor only has three color subpixels, again, in red, green, and blue, my shirt still looks very much like the same color red, even though the exact electromagnetic spectrum that's bouncing off of it from the lights in my studio here versus the light coming out of your monitor is going to be very different. Now, that said, I would caution that this is a vastly simplified explanation of a maddeningly complex subject that is color and vision and visual perception. So, we have three colors that we're either capturing or creating on our monitor. How does this all work then? Well, there are many ways to visualize what's going on with the RGB color model or in it. But in the abstract, one way to think about it is that you can imagine the intensity of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue, as the axes of a three-dimensional graph. At the origin, you have no contribution from any of the colors, so you have black. If you go along the red axis, you get an increasingly brighter, but still fully saturated, red. The same thing is true for the blue and green axes. Now, if you mix in a second color, say you start with red and add blue, then you move around in a plane made up by those two axes with the color that you're finding or getting somewhere in that area. So in this case, mixing blue and red gives you ultimately magenta. Likewise, red and green gives you yellow and blue and green gives you ultimately cyan. However, there is one special line in this visualization that we do need to take note of, and that is the body diagonal of the cube from its origin. Along this line, all of the primary colors are at equal powers, and you get all of the neutral colors from black to white. Now, as an aside, you may have also heard somewhere in the past the term additive color mixing. Usually this gets thrown up in some argument over what the real primary colors are and how what you were taught in school is wrong and so on and so forth. Fundamentally, that's what's going on for RGB, the RGB color model. Basically, our cameras, our monitors all use additive mixing, so does the software that's processing things, because we are dealing with light itself. That is, even though the reality is, is in your camera, you have color filters that are subtracting light or color from what gets to each sensor, the whole process is still called additive mixing and follows those rules, even though, as I said, it's subtractive or seems like it's subtractive in that case. Now, as an aside, subtractive mixing is the model that we use when we are talking about mixing a pigment that light will bounce off of. So subtractive mixing isn't actually dealing with light, it's dealing with something that absorbs light. Now, while this cubic color model that I've just introduced can help us visualize the results of mixing colors in an abstract sense, it doesn't really help us in a practical sense. In reality, the primary colors aren't ideal. And in fact, reality is nothing is ideal. And of course, that means things get much more messy. So in that respect, another useful visualization that we can use is something like this. Now, this is the CIEXY color space. And if you've ever done anything in color management, you've probably seen this before. If not, Let's take a moment to get our bearings on what this chart is showing us. So in the middle of this graph, you will see a not quite triangle with a convex curve at the top where the point should be. 
The bounded area is often colored in order to give you an idea of what colors fall where within it. And this is a simplified projection of all the possible colors that we can see. Now, I said it's simplified, and the simplification here is that in the CIE XY color space, brightness is ignored. That is, you can imagine brightness as being an axis that comes straight out of the graph that doesn't get dealt with. And that also means that black, every shade of gray, and white all exist at a single point. So it's a simplification. Now with this model in hand, we can actually start talking about, or visualing, visualizing and talking about actual colors. That is to say, exactly what red is red and so on and so forth. So we can start moving into the messy world of reality now and give a more practical idea of what's going on. That is to say, how do the numbers say 0 0.5, 0 0.28, and 0 0.61 turn into this magenta-y color? Now, for this, we need to start talking about color spaces and what they do and their function. And the broad detail here is that we, what we need to know is that a color space defines basically the stuff we need to take that abstract concept of RGB color and turn it into a concrete thing. So this includes the exact colors of each of the three primaries. That is in terms of hue, saturation, and brightness, although it has to be quantified more scientifically than that. It also means knowing the chromaticity or the color, irregardless of brightness, of that space's color space's white point, since that's where everything points to essentially. And remember in that XY chart, that's only one point. And since everything's neutral, you can do it with only two coordinates. Plus on top of that, we need everything else to make the math work, like the gamma curves and the mapping functions and all of that. Now in the real world, the color spaces primaries, that are that is the red, green, and blue that is the most pure colors that the color space has, set the gamut or range of colors that that color space can store or represent. Now that said, even though we are talking about RGB color here and RGB color spaces, you might realize the primaries don't technically have to be red, green, and blue. They could be anything as long as there's three of them and the math will still work. Though, if we go back and look at that XY chart, using colors that are vaguely red, green, and blue do give us the most efficient coverage of the visible spectrum for human vision. However, you might also have noticed something else looking at that chart. You may have noticed that with that rounded curve at the top, you can't cover all of the perceptible cover colors with just a single green primary, or at least it looks that way except you can. Since this is all just math and a mathematical model in a computer, the primaries don't have to be real colors. They can be imaginary colors. And by imaginary, I'm not talking about a color that we can't see, but exists in the electromagnetic spectrum. Think infrared or ultraviolet light. I'm talking about a color that can't actually exist at all. Now, while these colors can't be captured or created or anything like that and purely exist in the math of the color space, they allow us to extend the color gamut to better cover what we can see without needing to add more primary colors or change the math. And in fact, many of the color spaces you might already be familiar with do exactly this. So some of those spaces, for example, include Profoto RGB which uses imaginary blue and green primaries. And almost all, but not all, of the cinema gamuts, so Canon cinema gamut, red cinema gamut, Ari's wide gamut, etc., use imaginary colors for mo usually two, if not all three of their primaries. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that this does not come without a cost. 
Remember, we are talking about a digital system here, and that means that data is stored in both discrete steps, and there are a limited range of values that can be used for any amount of memory or given amount of memory that is allocated. In fact, this is what the bits are. When people talk about 10 bits, 8 bits, 14 bits, etc., they're talking about how much space and therefore how many values are available to store information. Now, the problem here is that the larger you make the color spaces gamut, the more you stretch things out, the more bits you need to have both enough values and enough precision from those values to accurately store all of the colors that we can see or that we can see within that color gamut without posterizing them. That is creating errors where the color that you should have recorded becomes some other color that's adjacent but not quite correct. Now, this whole problem is further compounded by color spaces that use imaginary primaries. As that means some of the range that you can code values for can't actually ever be used. And so some of the values or the bits that you are allocating can never actually be set. Now, we're not going to talk about this a lot more in this video because we're going to talk about that in a whole lot of detail when we get to color spaces that do this and as we see what the actual problems can be. Now, while the RGB model is an efficient way to store color for human consumption, it's not without some limitations. And one of the biggest pitfalls of the RGB color model is that the brightness and color are interrelated. Remember, it's three different lights being shown together and blended. So aside from the primaries themselves, you can't actually make an arbitrary color brighter or darker by changing only a single value in that RGB triple. Likewise, you cannot change a color's hue or saturation without also recomputing and changing all three RGB values as well. Now, the problem here isn't so much that doing the math to manipulate the color is impossible for a computer. I mean, at least not for anything approaching a modern CPU, GPU, or image-specific digital signal processor like is in your camera. The problem here has to actually do with storing and transmitting information efficiently. And why might that be a problem, or might you want to do that? Well. The simple answer is a color image takes up three times as much space as a monochrome image does. Now, that might not be a problem for you photographers out there that only take one or two pictures at a time, but for video shooters, that becomes a real issue when you're taking 24, 60, or 120 images every second and you're shooting for potentially minutes or hours on end. Now, fortunately, the engineers working on early TV and color understood this and realized that a lot of space could be saved through using another quirk of human vision, which is specifically that our ability to resolve color information is only around a third of that of our ability to resolve brightness changes. So it then follows that if we can separate the color information from the brightness information, then we could easily store or send that brightness data at a higher resolution than the color data is. Thus, of course, we save space. And this brings me to the second of our color models that we're talking about in this video. Now, I'm calling this the luminance chrominance or luma chroma color model, but Odds are you'll likely recognize these as either YCC or YUV in ter or name. However, those are specific implementations of these color models, not the concept as a whole. So what is a Luma Chroma model and how is it different from RGB? Well, where RGB stores color and brightness intertwined in three RGB values, the brightness of those three lights, so to speak, Luma Chroma models store brightness or luminance is one thing and color or chrominance separately. Now that said, you won't find a Luma Chroma camera or display, though 
almost all of them can produce or interpret data in this format, the reality is, is you can't actually capture or generate it using this. Now, all Lumachroma color spaces are actually just transformations of RGB or some RGB color space into this alternate representation. So what does the Luma and Chroma values represent or look like? Well, hopefully luminance should be intuitively easy to understand. It's just the brightness of a color or pixel in question. Think of it as a black and white image because, well, that's what it is. Now that said, I have seen a lot of discussions on this that try to say that basically this is just the green channel from your camera and that no math is done, they just take the green channel and that becomes luminance. That's not true. Luminance in a Lumachroma format is the weighted sum of all of the RGB channels that your camera is recording. Now, the other hand, the other problem is chrominance. And I have always found that the chrominance values and the chrominance side of things is a lot harder to wrap my head around. Now, typically, these are the blue and red differences, although they are called different things in different cases, but generally that's what's actually happening on or happening with them. And they're actually the difference between the blue and red signals and the luminance signal that we started with. So they're not really blue and red either. But the conceptual hard part here is understanding exactly what this looks like. And well, the short of it is, is it looks something like this. This is a colorized plot of the blue and red difference signals from the YCBCR color space at 50% luminance. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the biggest benefit of a Lumachroma color model is to store color images more efficiently by storing the color information at a lower resolution than the brightness. Now, this process is known as chroma subsampling, and at least it dates back at least to the addition to color uh, to broadcast television in the mid 1950s. I don't know if it goes back any further. It's also arguably one of the first, if not the first, lossy image compression method. Now, I should note that chroma subsampling is not a requirement of Lumachroma formats. You can have the, all three pieces of information at every pixel. And of course, if you do that, the Lumachroma file will take up just as much space as an RGB file. All that said, it's easy to knock Lumachroma for being old and seemingly janky and possibly even for the fact that it kind of does this chroma subsampling and that's lossy image compression and information is being thrown away and maybe that's not so great. But it has stood the test of time and it continues to be used as a co core part of most lossy image and video compression algorithms, even new ones created today. It's used in JPEG, HEIF, HEVC, AVC, even ProRes and DNxHR all use this approach. Now, with that said, I'm going to wrap this up here. As I said at the outset, this is intended to be a high level overview of RGB and Lumachroma color models. And I think I've kind of accomplished that. Now, of course, for most of us as photographers, we either don't have a choice in how things are stored with the formats that we're shooting, or we don't have to deal with this anyway since the computers and software that we use do it for us. Hopefully, though, this has shed some light on what's going on under the hood, and I think this is going to start being more important when we start talking about just what is going on with chromas or color spaces, just what's going on with log curves, and how bit depth and those interact and affect the quality of this video that we're shooting. So with that said, I hope you found this interesting or at least informative. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you'd like to help and support this channel, you can help us by liking and sharing this video. You can also support us directly by hitting that thanks button or buying yourself something you've always wanted from one of our affiliate links in the description below. As always, thanks for watching and 
I'll see you next time.